the Brockton Public Library. I'm Paula Jones, and I'm happy to invite you to this program. We have Phyllis Ellis with the NAACP, and the program is entitled Dreams Begin with Dreaming. So let's give a warm welcome to Phyllis. Thank you. Before we start, I'm going to ask Bishop Branch to come up here and give us a little prayer. Amen. Short prayer. <laughs> Why do y'all always do that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about you, but I stand to give God reverence. I realize that when you stand, you're elevating yourself to heaven. If you can bow your heads and close your eyes, please. Father God, in the name of the Christ that I serve, Lord, I ask that you bless this event. I ask that you bless the, the occupants here, that we may provide oral history to those that are not. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This is our second um, program. Paula asked us to come back because we were so good last year. This is Dreamers Part 2. <laughs> Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. That was quoted by one of my heroes, Harriet Tubman. I love her. Black History Month honors the contributions of African Americans to U.S. history. Did you know that Madam C.J. Walker was America's first woman to become a self-made millionaire? Or that George Washington Carver was able to derive nearly 300 products from the peanuts? Mm -hmm. The celebration of Black History Month began as a Negro History Week, which was created in 1926 by Carter G. Woodson, a noted African American historian, scholar, educator, and publisher. It became a month-long celebration in 1976. The month of February was chosen to coincide with birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Do you guys know who the first heavyweight champ was? Black heavyweight champ? Yes. Jack Johnson. Very good. He became the first African-American man to hold the world championship boxing title in 1908. He held onto the belt until 1915. What about the first lawyer? Does anyone know that? John Mercer Langston was the first black man to become a lawyer when he passed the bar in Ohio in 1854. You all know about Thurgood Marshall, right? Oh, yeah. What about George Washington Carver? Yeah, yes. I read when I was younger. Okay. <laughs> okay, what about what about the first senator? Edward Brooke. Ed Brooke. The first senator. senator. Hiram Rhodes Rebels yeah. was the first African American ever elected to the U.S. Senate. He represented the state of Mississippi wow, wow. from February 1870 to March 1871. The, wow. the first Harem Rose Rebels. Never heard of them, huh? <laughs> okay, the first woman representative. Shirley Chisholm. Yes. The first self made millionaire woman. Madam, Madam C.J. Walker was born on a cotton plantation in Louisiana and became wealthy after inventing a line of African-American hair care products. She established Madame C.J. Walker Laboratories and was known for her philanthropy. Okay, Oscar winner first. Sydney Portier. Woman, no. Oh, oh come on, you guys know this. Oh, the one that played in Gone with the Wind. You got it, Hattie McDaniels. <laughs> the first woman into space. First. Well, I forgot her name, but I remember. First black woman to space. Yes. Mae Jameson. Remember? Okay. What year? 1992. Okay. Okay. The first African American president. Right. <laughs> okay. We also have a, a PowerPoint presentation today. We're going back in time with black history, the uh, important timelines in black history. So we're going to get started. We're going back to the 1600s. Can you guys hear me all right? 1619, the first African slaves arrived in Virginia. In 1746, Lucy Terry, Terry, an enslaved person in 1746, becomes the earliest known black American poet when she writes about the last American Indian attack on her village of Deerfield, Massachusetts. 1773. Phyllis Wheatley, she was actually a slave and she was uh, in Massachusetts. Um, she wrote poems on various subjects, religious and moral, morale, and is published in 
and she was the first African American to do so. Seventeen seventy three. Slavery is made illegal in the Northwest Territory. The U.S. Constitution states that Congress may not ban the slave trade until 1808. In 1793, Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin greatly increases the demand for slave labor. 1793, a federal fugitive slave law is enacted, providing for the returned slaves who had escaped and crossed state lines. I think I skipped. 1800, Gabriel Prosser, an enslaved African-American blacksmith, that's not up here, organizes a slave revolt intended to march on Richmond, Virginia. The conspiracy is uncovered, and Prosser and a number of the rebels are hanged. Virginia's slave laws are consequently tightened. In 1808, Congress bans the importation of slaves from Africa. In 1820, the Missouri Compromise bans slavery north of the southern boundary of Missouri. 1822, Denmark Vesey, an enslaved African-American carpenter who had purchased his freedom, plans a slave revolt with the intent to lay siege on Charleston, South Carolina. The, the plot is discovered and Vesey and 34 co-conspirators are hanged. Eighteen thirty one. Before there was Black Lives Matter. Nat Turner. My hero. Nat Turner. My hero. Nat Turner, an enslaved African American preacher, leads the most significant slave uprising in American history. He and his band of followers launched a short, bloody rebellion in Southampton County, Virginia. Yes. The militia squells the rebellion and Turner is eventually love hanging people. And turn is eventually hanged. As a consequence, Virginia institutes much stricter slave laws. William Lloyd Garrison begins publishing The Liberator, a weekly paper that advocates the complete abolition of slavery. He becomes one of the most famous figures. Eighteen thirty-nine. There was a movie about this. On July the 2nd, 1839, 53 African slaves on board the slave ship, the Amistad, remember that? Revolted against their captors, killing all but the ship's navigator, who sailed them to the Long Island, New York, instead of their intended destination, Africa. Eighteen forty six, the Wilmot Proviso, introduced by Democratic Representative David Wilmot of Pennsylvania, attempts to ban slavery and territory gain in the Mexican War. The proviso is blocked by Southerners, but continues to inflame the debate over slavery. Frederick Douglass launches his newspaper, anti slavery newspaper. 20 and went on to become a world-renowned anti-slavery activist. I'm not going to read it all. Harriet Tubman. This is my hero. Okay. Harriet Tubman was definitely my hero. Harriet Tubman was born a slave, but she was determined not to remain a slave. Okay. She wanted, give me liberty or give me death. And her exact quote was, I had reason this out in my mind that there was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have the one, I would have the other, okay? So she was born a slave, but she was determined not to uh, remain a slave. 
she was so determined that she left her husband and her kids to escape to freedom, to Maryland. She made it. But once she got there, she was like, well, there's no one here to welcome me. So what am I going to do now? I need my people with me. Amen. So what did she do? She went back. And they started the Underground Railroad. Amen. And they started bringing slaves over. Amen. And she didn't lose not one slave. History has that she carried a gun, but I don't know how true that is. <laughs> but all of a sudden, she, she freed hundreds of slaves, hundreds, hundreds of slaves. And um, she was also known to be uh, a nurse. And someone said she was also a spy, but I don't know how true that is. And there is talk of putting her on the $20 bill, but that's a dream that I hope is coming to reality. But we shall see. Amen. Black Moses. Harriet Tubman, my hero. My kind of woman. <laughs> okay. Okay. 1815. All right. I'm skipping. Trying to get back to you. 1857, Congress passes the Kansas Nebraska Act, establishing the territories of Kansas and Nebraska. In 1859, John Brown and 21 followers mm -hmm. captured the federal arsenal of Hopper's Ferry in an attempt to launch a slave revolt. In 1861, the Confederacy is founded when the Deep South secedes and the Civil War begins. issues the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that all persons held as slaves within the Confederate States are, and his forts shall be free. Yes. 1863, they freed us. 1865, Congress establishes the Freedom Bureau to protect the rights of newly emancipated blacks. The Civil War ends on April 9th. Lincoln is assassinated April 14th. The Ku Klux Klan is formed in Tennessee by ex-Confederates in May. Slavery in the United States is effectively ended when 250,000 slaves in Texas finally received the news that the Civil War had ended two months earlier, June 19th. 13th Amendment to the Constitution is ratified, prohibiting slavery. All right. All right. All right now. Key moments in American black history. Okay, I skipped a bit. 1865 through 1866, black codes are passed by southern states, drastically restricting the rights of newly freed slaves. In 1867, a series of Reconstruction Acts are passed, carving the former Confederacy into five military districts and guaranteeing the civil rights of freed slaves. In 1868, 14th Amendment to the Constitution is ratified, defining citizenship citizenship. Individuals born or naturalized in the United States are American citizens, including those born as slaves. This nullifies the Dred Scott case of 1857, which had ruled that blacks were not citizens. Eighteen sixty nine, Howard University's law school becomes the country's first black law school. All right. Eighteen seventy. The 15th Amendment to the Constitution is ratified, giving blacks the right to vote. Heron Brewells of Mississippi is elected to the county's first, first African-American senator. During Reconstruction, 16 blacks served in Congress and about 600 served in state legislatures. All right, get it together. eighteen seventy seven reconstruction ends in the south federal attempts to provide some basic civil rights for african americans quickly erode eighteen seventy nine the black exodus takes place in which tens of thousands of african americans migrated from south southern states to kansas in eighteen seventy nine spelman college the first college for black women in the u.s is founded by sophia p packard and harriet e 
Giles. Booker T. Washington founds the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute in Alabama. The school becomes one of the leading schools of higher learning for African Americans and stresses the practical application of knowledge. In, 19, in 1896, George Washington Carver begins teaching there as a director of the Department of Agricultural Research, gaining an international reputation for his agricultural advances. Eighteen eighty two Plessy versus Ferguson. This landmark Supreme Court decision holds that racial segregation is constitutional, paving the way for the oppressive Jim Crow laws in the South. We're gonna take a break and we're gonna elaborate this a little bit. All right. Good afternoon. As Phyllis just said, in May of 1896, by a vote of 7 to 1, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled on Plessy v. Ferguson. This was a landmark decision of the United States Supreme Court. It upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities as long as the segregated facilities were equal in quality. A doctrine that became known as, and I quote, separate but equal. This legitimized the state laws reestablishing racial segregation <coughs> that were passed in the American South in the late 19th century after the end of the Reconstruction Era. Nine months earlier, Charles Hamilton Houston was born in Washington, D.C. He became a black lawyer who helped play a role in dismantling Jim Crow laws and helped train future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Known as the man who killed Jim Crow, he played a role in nearly every civil rights case before the Supreme Court between 1930 and the Brown versus Board of Education ruling in 1954. Houston's brilliant plan to attack and defeat Jim Crow segregation by using the inequality of the separate but equal doctrine as it pertained to public education in the United States was the master stroke that brought about the landmark decision. He wrote, and I quote, the fight for equality of educational opportunity was not an isolated struggle. All our struggles must tie in together and support one another. We must remain on the alert and push the struggle farther with all our might. Born in Washington, D.C., used to prepare for college at Dunbar High School in Washington, and then matriculated to Amherst College graduating Phi Beta Kappa in 1915. From 1915 to 1917, Houston taught English at Howard University. From 1917 to 1919, he was the first lieutenant in the United States Infantry based in Fort Meade, Maryland. Houston later wrote, the hate and scorn showered on us Negro officers by our fellow Americans convinced me that there was no sense in my dying for a world ruled by them. I made up my mind that if I got through this war, I would study law and use my time fighting for men who could not strike back. In the fall of 1919, he entered Harvard Law School, earned his Bachelor of Laws degree in 1922, and his Doctor of Laws degree in 1923. In 1922, he became the first African American to serve as an editor of the Harvard Law Review. After studying at the University of Madrid in 1924, Houston was admitted to the District of Columbia Bar that same year, and later joined forces with his father in practicing law. During the 1930s, I'm sorry, beginning in the 1930s, Houston served as the first special counsel to the National Association for the Investment of Colored People, and therefore was involved with the majority of civil rights cases from then until his death on April 22, 1950. He later joined Howard's law school's faculty, establishing a long-standing relationship with Howard and Harvard law schools. While at Howard, he was the mentor to Thurgood Marshall, who argued Brown v. Board of Education and was later appointed to the Supreme Court. Houston used his post at Howard to recruit talented students into the NAACP's legal efforts. 
among them Marshall and Oliver Hill, the first and second ranked students in the class of 1933, both of whom were drafted into the organization's legal battles by Houston. By the mid-1930s, two separate anti-religion bills backed by the NAACP had sealed the Green Passage. The organization had won a landmark victory against the restrictive housing covenants. They excluded black from popular neighborhoods, <coughs> only to see the achievements undermined by subsequent legal precedents. This is struck upon the idea that the unequal education was the, un was the Achilles heel of Jim Crow. By demonstrating the failure of states to even try to live up to the 1896 rule of separate but equal, Houston finally <coughs> fight, hoped to finally overturn the Plessy versus Ferguson rule and had given birth to that phrase. His title was broad, but the evidence was numerous. Southern states collectively spent half, less than half of what was allotted for white students on education for blacks. There was even greater disparities in individual school districts. Black schools were equipped with cast off supplies from the white ones and built with inferior materials. Black facilities appeared to be part of a crude segregationist satire, a design to make black education a contradiction in terms. Houston designed a, the strategy of attacking segregation in law schools, forcing states to either create costly parallel law schools or integrate the existing ones. The strategy of hidden benefits, benefits since law students were predominantly male, used to start to neutralize the age-old argument that allowing blacks to attend white institutions would lead to miscegenation or race mixing. He also reasoned that judges deciding the cases might be more sympathetic to plaintiffs who were pursuing careers in law. Finally, by challenging segregation in graduate schools, the NAACP lawyers would bypass the inflammatory issue of miscegenation among young two children. The successful, successful rule in hands down in the Brown decision was testament to the massive strategy formulated by Houston. Houston was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, the first intercollegiate Greek letter fraternity established for African Americans. Yusuf was posthumously awarded the NAACP's Spring Iron Medal in 1950, and in 1958, the main building of the Howard University Law School was dedicated as Charles Hamilton Houston Hall. His importance became more broadly known through the success of Thurgood Marshall, and after the 1983 publication of Jenna Ray McNeil's groundwork, the Charles Hamilton Houston and the Struggle for Civil Rights. Houston is the namesake of the Charles Houston Bar Association and the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard Law School, which opened in the fall of 2005. In addition, there is a fellowship, I'm sorry, a professorship at Harvard Law School named after him. Houston died in Washington, D.C. on April 22, 1950. can feel free to help yourself to refreshment at any time over there. You don't have to wait until <laughs> I'm done with my long program. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. 1905. I think she took me up on it too. <laughs> W.D. Bowes founds the Niagara Movement, a forerunner to the NAACP. The movement is formed in part as a protest to Booker T. Washington's policy of accommodation to white society. The Niagara, the Niagara movement embraces a more radical approach, calling for immediate equality in all areas of American life. We're going to elaborate on this one as well. Mr. Jackson. Thank you. W.E.B. Du Bois. William Edward Burgard was born 1868, passed in 1963. He was a leading African-American socialist writer and activist. Educated at Harvard University and other top schools, Du Bois studied with some of the most important social thinkers of his time. He earned fame for the publication of such works as Soul of Black Folk, 1903. 
and was a founding officer of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, and editor of its magazine. Du Bois also taught at Wilberforce University, Atlantic U Atlanta University, and chaired the Peace Information Center. Shortly before his death, Du Bois settled in Ghana to work on the Encyclopedia Africana. Born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, Du Bois knew little of his father who died shortly after, after his birth, but he was socialized into an extended family network that left a strong impression on his personality and was reflected in his subsequent, subsequent work. Educated at Fisk University, 1885 to 1888, Harvard University, 1888 to 1896, and the University of Berlin, 1892 to 1894. As you can see, Du Bois was a very educated man. He studied with some of the most important social thinkers of his time and then embarked upon a seven-year career that combined scholarship and teaching with lifelong activism and, liber and liberation struggles. W.E.B. Du Bois. Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey establishes the Universal Negro Improvement Association, an influential black nationalist organization to promote the spirit of race pride and create a sense of worldwide unity among blacks. 1920s, the Harlem Renaissance flourishes in the 1920s and the 1930s. This literary, artistic, and intellectual movement fosters a new black cultural identity. In 1931, nine black youths are indicted in Scottsboro, Alabama on charges of having raped two white women. Although the evidence was slim, the Southern jury sentenced them to death. The Supreme Court overturns their convictions twice. Each time, Alabama retries them, finding them guilty. In a third trial, four of the Scottsboro boys are freed but five are sentenced to long prison terms. Story of our life. Nineteen forty seven. Jackie Robinson breaks Major League Baseball's color barrier when he is signed to the Brooklyn Dodgers by Branch Rickey. We have um, Mr. Robinson here today. All right? <laughs> Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier and became the first black athlete to play Major League Baseball in the 20th century. He joined the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947 and was named Rookie of the Year that year. National League MVP in 1949 and the World Series champ in 1955. Jackie Robinson became the first athlete to play Major League Baseball. Throughout his decade-long career, Robinson distinguished himself as one of the game's most talented and exciting players. He floated and recorded an impressive 311 career batting average. He was also a vocal civil rights activist. He died in Connecticut in 1972 from heart problems and diabetes complications. In the early 1940s, Jackie Robinson met U.S. and Trinity Rachel is on Robinson when they were both attending the University of California, Los Angeles. The couple mm -hmm. were married in February 10, 1946. As Jackie made his career in the major leagues, the couple faced mountain racism mm -hmm. from insults to death threats. Later in life, both Jackie and Rachel became involved actively in the civil rights movement. Jackie and Rachel had three children together, Jack, Sharon, and David. Rachel said that she and Jackie went to great lengths to create a nurturing home that sheltered their kids from racism. In 1971, the couple's oldest child, Jack Robinson Jr., died at the age of 24 in a car accident. The middle child, Sharon Robinson, is an author and a consultant for Major League Baseball, 
Well, their youngest <coughs> child, David Robinson, is a coffee farmer in Tanzania. Right. Jack Roosevelt Robinson was born on January 31st, 1919, in Cairo, Georgia. The youngest of five children, Robinson was raised in relative poverty by a single mother. He attended the John Muir High School and the Pasadena Junior College, where he was an excellent athlete and played four sports, baseball, basketball, track, and, space, and football. He named the region's most valuable player in baseball in 1938. Robinson's older brother, Matthew Robinson, inspired Jack to pursue his, pursue his talent and love of athletics. Matthew won a silver medal in the 2000 I'm sorry, the 200 meter dash just behind Jesse Owens at the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. Jesse continued his education at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he became the university's first student to win varsity letters in four sports. In 1941, despite his athletic success, Robinson was forced to leave UCLA <laughs> just shy of graduation due to financial hardship. He moved to Honolulu, Hawaii where he played football for the semi-professional Honolulu Bears. His season with the Bears was cut short when the United States entered into World War II. From 1942 to 1944, Robinson served as second lieutenant in the United States Army. However, he never saw a combat. During boot camp in Fort Hood, Texas, Robinson was arrested and court-martialed in 1944 for refusing to give up his seat and move to the back of a segregated bus. Mm -hmm. Robinson's excellent reputation, combined with the efforts of friends, the NAACP, and various black newspapers, shed public light on the injustice. Ultimately, he was acquitted of the charges and received an honorable discharge. His courage and moral objection to segregation were precursors to the impact Robinson would have in Major League Baseball. After his discharge from the Army in 1944, Robinson, took, Robinson began to play baseball professionally. At the time, the sport was segregated, and African-Americans and whites played in separate leagues. Robinson began playing in the Negro Leagues, where he was soon chosen by Branch Rickey, president of the Los Angeles Dodgers, to help integrate Major League Baseball. He joined the all-white Montreal Royals, a fine team of the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1946. <coughs> Robinson later moved to Florida to begin spring training with the Royals. Ricky knew there would be difficult times ahead for the young athletes, so made Robinson promise not to fight back when confronted with racism. Ricky also personally tested Robinson's reactions to racial slurs and insults he knew the player would endure. From the beginning of his career with the Dodgers, Robinson's will was tested. Even some of his new teammates objected to having an African-American on their team. People in the crowd sometimes jeered Robinson, and he and his family received threats. Despite the racial, the racial abuse, particularly at away games, Robinson had an outstanding style with the Dodgers, I'm sorry, with the Royals. Leading the instructional league with a 349 batting average and 985 fielding percentage. His success, successful year led to the promotion to join the Dodgers. Robinson played his first game at Ebbets Field for the Brooklyn Dodgers on April 15, 1947, making history as the first black athlete to play Major League Baseball in the 20th century. The harassment continued. Many players on opposing teams threatened not to play against the Dodgers. Even his own teammates threatened to sit out. But Dodgers manager Leo DeRocha informed them that he would rather trade them than Robinson. His loyalty to the players set the tone for the rest of Robinson's career with the team. Others defended Jackie Robinson's right to play in the major leagues, including league president Ford Frick, baseball commissioner Happy Chandler, Jewish baseball star Hank Greenberg, and Dodger shortstop and team captain Pee Wee Reese. Robinson succeeded in putting the prejudice and racial strife aside and showed everyone what a talented player he was. In his first year, he batted 297 with 12 home runs and helped the Dodgers win the National League pennant. That year, Robinson led the National League in stolen bases and was selected as Rookie of the Year. He continued to wow fans and credit the light with his impressive feat, such as an outstanding 342 batting average in the 49th season. He led 
building bases that year, and the National League's MVP. His success as a major league player opened the doors for other African American players such as Satchel Page, Willie Mays, and Hank Aaron. After baseball, Robinson became active in business and continued to work as an activist for social change. He once said, and I'm going to quote this, there's not an American in this country free until every one of us is free. Amen. He worked as an executive for Chalk Full Nut Coffee Company and wrestling chain and helped establish the African American owned and controlled Freedom Bank. In 1962, Robinson was the first African American to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. In 1972, the Dodgers retired as number 42. In 1997, on the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson's first year with the Dodgers, Major League Baseball permanently retired Robinson's uniform number 42. He's the only baseball player to ever have that and so on. As he was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Honor by President Ronald Reagan in 1984. And before I finish with a quote from Jackie, I just want to add something. Um, in 1965, after Jackie was the first African American to be elected to the Hall of Fame, he was elected as a Major League Baseball player, not as a member of the Negro League. In Ted Williams' acceptance speech in 1965 to be inducted to the Hall of Fame, he blasted the Hall of Fame saying that the Hall of Fame is no good if you don't start admitting members of the Negro League who could not join Major Leagues at the time. So people Amen. like the people like um, Josh Gibson and Satchel Page and others whose names skip me right now started to get admitted after that. So I'm going to finish with a quote from Jackie that explains his life. Many people resented my impatience and honesty, but I never cared about offenses as much as I cared about respect. Above anything else, I hate to lose. I speak to you only as an American who happens to be an American Negro and one who is proud of that heritage. We ask for nothing special. We ask only that we be permitted to compete on an even basis. And if we are not worthy, then the competition, competition shall, per se, eliminate us. I think if we go back and check our record, the Negro has proven beyond a doubt that we have been more than patient in seeking our rights as American citizens. How you play in yesterday's game is all that counts. Nineteen forty eight. Although African Americans had participated in every major U.S. war, it was not until after World War II that President Harry S. Truman issued an executive order integrating the U.S. Armed Forces. In 1952, Malcolm X becomes the Minister of the Nation of Islam. Over the next several years, his influence increases until he is one of the two most powerful members of the black Muslims. And right now, we're going to have Mr. Malcolm X come and tell us about himself. Well, first of all, we should say this. It is wonderful to be able to celebrate uh, Black History Month in the city of Rockton. We thank the NAACP and we thank the library for doing this. Give the library the NAACP and now, y'all know how I am. I'm going to do this, but I need you to say these words. I am not a Negro. I am not a Negro. Y'all not talking back. I'm not a Negro. I'm not a Negro. I am human. I am human. I am not white. I am not white. I am human. I am human. It's about charity of humanity. Say charity. Charity. Is what I'm going to give. Now give yourself a hand clap. Malcolm X was an activist and an outspoken public voice of the black Muslims. Of the black Muslims. Malcolm challenged the mainstream civil rights movement and the nonviolent pursuit of integration that was championed by Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm urged his followers to defend themselves against white aggression. Malcolm's greatest quote was, by any means necessary. 
Malcolm Vaughn, Malcolm Little, he changed his last name to X. For those of us who are familiar with the Nation of Islam, X signifies the rejection of our slave name. Charismatic and eloquent, Malcolm became an influential leader of the Nation of Islam, excuse me, which combined Islam and black nationalism and sought to encourage the enfranchised and disadvantaged young blacks searching for confidence in a segregated America. Malcolm X's death in 1965, his best-selling book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, publicized his ideas, particularly among black youth. It laid the foundation for the black power movements in the late 60s and 1970s. You will note that the speech, a part of the speech that I'm going to read to you, there is a clear contrast, amen, between Dr. King and Malcolm X. All right. Malcolm told it like it was. Malcolm was uh, uh, proud to be black. Malcolm believed in black power. Malcolm said on May 5th of 1963, who taught you to hate yourself? Think about that. Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin? To such an extent you bleach it to get like the white man. This is still going on, so don't look at me like I'm crazy. Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips, thinking that the volume of your lips is something that is ugly. Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Think about it. Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to so much that you don't want to be around each other? Who am I talking to? No, before you ask anything about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he does not teach hate. You should ask yourself, who taught you to hate? Who taught you to hate? Who taught you basically not to be what God made you? The nation of Islam, we don't steal. We don't gamble. We don't lie. We don't cheat. You can't get into a whiskey bottle without getting past a government seal. You can't buy a deck of cards without getting past a government seal. Here the white man makes the whiskey then puts you in jail for getting drunk. He sells you the cards and the dice and puts you in jail when he catches you using them. Mm, mm, mm. Y'all act like y'all don't know what's going on. Preach, oh, preach. We know, we know. Then when it comes, and I'm paraphrasing it, then when it comes to our black women, oh, they are the most disrespected in America. Yeah. The black woman, the most unprotected person in America. The black woman, the most neglected in America. Who is this black woman? And as Muslims, the Elijah Muhammad teaches us to protect our women. And to, says he said it twice, protect our women. And the only time a Muslim will get violent is when someone goes to molest our women. Uh oh. Uh oh. Right. Uh -oh. Right. We will kill you for our women. Yes, I'm making it plain. We will kill you for our women. We believe that if the white man would do whatever is necessary to see that his woman gets respect and protection, then you and I will never be recognized as men until we stand like men and pay the same penalty over the head of anyone who puts their filthy hand in the direction of our women. Amen. That was Malcolm X. The next um, gentleman is actually not on my timeline, but he was important uh, nonetheless. His name is Garrett Morgan, and Mr. Morgan is in the house right now. Mr. Morgan? Mr. Morgan, where are you? Oh, there he is! Oh, 
Good evening, everyone. Good, good, evening. Afternoon. good afternoon. Good afternoon, Brian. Uh, Nia, if you could pass up that folder of... Uh... I'm just going to give everybody just a little uh, pictures of... Uh, of what Garrett, Garrett Morgan, I was an inventor back in the turn of the century, the uh, 20th century. Okay, let me help my wife here. She even came along from heaven with me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Mrs. Morgan, yeah. Okay, why? Well, is passing those out. I just want to start. Gary, well, I was an inventor, a black inventor, American inventor here in the United States. And just to give you a, a little beginning on being an inventor, back in 1861, when the North was seg uh, split from the South, Confederate President, President Jefferson Davis, one of the first things he did when he became president was apply the Confederate Patent Act. Basically, that applied to all southern states in the Confederacy. And what it did was prevent patterns, inventions, that black, folk, black folks made or invented. It, that would be the property of the white folks. That's right. So if we invented something before that time or during that time, it wasn't counted. So God only knows how many inventions prior to that time when that we invented, but we weren't um, given the um, acclaims for it. Okay. All right. I was born in Paris, Kentucky, back in 1877. Thank you. And um, of course, in Kentucky, we couldn't get an education, much of an education black folks couldn't. So I got a fifth, sixth grade education. But in my mind, I felt I could, I could do things with my hands. I was thinking a lot, fixing things. So I told my mom and dad that I'm heading up north to try to get a better life. Because if I stayed in Paris, Kentucky, all I would probably do is uh, clean horse stables or whatever. So I packed my bag. My mom made me a sandwich. And I went on up. I, um, I walked, and I took the train, and we jumped on a train, didn't pay for the train, we stayed in the cargo deck, and I first stop I made was Cincinnati, Ohio. But when I got to Cincinnati, Ohio, there wasn't much for black men or women to do. Um, I went and applied for a few jobs. The only thing I got was sweeping floors. But my mind was still working. So after about a year, I left Cincinnati and went over to Cleveland, Ohio. Now, Cleveland at that time was a um, very popular city, busting with manufacturing jobs, everything. So I went around Cleveland looking for a job. And of course, even in Cleveland, I got the same response. We don't hire black folks here. But I, back, back then, they didn't call us black folks. Y'all know what they call us, the N-word. Yes, amen. That's right. So, uh, but I did find work finally as a handyman. Um, I was very mechanically, mechanically inclined. So I convinced the, um, the uh, owner of the um, manufacturing plant to let me work on some things. So he started letting me work on um, sewing machines. Amen. Because basically it was, a, um, it was a manufacturing of women's garments. So they had, back then, uh, most 95% of um, the American clothing was made in America. So they found that I was very good at fixing things. So um, I saw that the sewing machine, when it sewed, sometimes it would burn wool material, scorched it. So I figured, I said, well, let me figure out a way to, to prevent that. So I uh, made this formula. And while I was working on the formula, the, um, the lubricant, um, the wife called me in to go to um, dinner. So I wiped my hands, because I had some of the lubricant on my hands. I wiped it on a wool cloth. And when I came back, the lubricant smoothed out the wool cloth. 
So I said, wow. So I said, this smoothed out the wool cloth. So what I did was I took some of that lubricant and I got my dog Scooby and <laughs> reluctantly Scooby, I um, put some of that lubricant on his hair because he had tight dog hair. And after a few minutes, the dog hair was nice and smooth. So I said, well, I might have something here. So I decided to use myself as a guinea pig, went to the mirror, took some of this stuff, put it on a comb, and put it on my hair, and it straightened my hair. I think unconsciously, black folks wanted to be accepted by white folks, so they figured, well, if, we, if our hair is straight like them, then maybe they'll accept us. Well, we know that wasn't the case, but still, black folks liked it. So I had my first hair product that I invented, um, again, by accident. And then in 1913, I formed my own hair refinery company called the G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Company. And so I made some money, started to make a little money, but I was still, my mind was still going as far as trying to invent things. So I, they called me the safety inventor, so I'll tell you why. So I noticed in the city of Cleveland when there was fires, especially fires that were two, three, fours up, by the time the firefighters got there, they couldn't help the people that were up there still alive. They would have to jump or they would just perish. Because back then there still wasn't um, ladders on the fire truck yet. So I said, well, there's got to be a way for the firemen to get in there and rescue some of these poor folks. So I started working on an item I called the safety hood. Now, the safety hood basically was um, kind of rubbery on the front with, with eyes, you can see, and canvas in the back. It had a couple of two long tubes where I could breathe, and the tubes ran down to about my ankles because when the fire, if, if someone goes into a house and there's fire, what the smoke do? Rise. So I could breathe so much uh, fresh air, and um, I also had a, what was called, now this was the key, a carbon filter that I made up to filter what little smoke would come through that tube. And finally I got my big, I didn't really have um, many takers for it because it really wasn't, Nobody believed in it until later that year, 1916, Cleveland was building a water treatment plant tunnel underneath the Lake Erie. And what happened was a bad gas explosion. And there was a lot of men in there that were hurt or dead. So somebody in the crowd remembered, hey, this guy Garrett Morgan has a safety hood. Maybe he can help us. So they ran and got me, me and my brother Joe, grabbed all our safety hoods, we had about six or seven of them, went down to the tunnel where the accident happened, and when it was time to go in, we asked some of our white brothers, y'all ready? They didn't want to go. They didn't believe it. So me and my brother Joe went in, and when we got to the point of where the explosion happened, there was a lot of dead bodies, but there were some men that were still alive. So we grabbed, we grabbed, um, the cart that we had put the guys that were still alive and even some of the dead ones and we, pu and we pulled the cart out. Now by the time we got out of the tunnel, people were amazed. They were just, couldn't believe it because what I forgot to tell you was they sent a rescue crew in there to rescue their men before they came and got me, but they went in there and got overcome by the gases. So that's when they came and got me. So they were shocked that these two black men came out with their white brothers. So uh, we ended up, so after that first time, then you saw the white brothers, they went and grabbed that couple of masks and someone put them on, put them on, and we all went in back the second time. So we went in two or three times and um, got big accolade. Well, I didn't, see that was a problem. When it was done, they did not want to give Garrett Morgan the, um, the what's the word? The credit, yes. They didn't want to give, them, give me the credit for res rescuing these people with the safety hood. They made all kinds of excuses. There was even a reporter took a front page, front, a photo that was put on the front page of the Cleveland paper of me there bringing out the, um, some of the wounded 
and I had my gas mask off. But they even said, well, we don't know if that's really him. He's got straight hair. Is that really OK? So yes. So as time went on, I was still working on saying, what else could I do? So um, I started my, uh, let's see, what was the other thing? Uh, oh, gas mask. Oh, the gas mask. Well, the gas mask, basically, let me just tell you a little bit. Gas mask. In uh, just before World War One, the United States government contacted me and bought my pattern for ten thousand dollars. And basically, the um, the U.S. government modified it. They took away the long um, tubes, but they but they had the carbon filter right there. But basically. This is because of Gary Morgan. And these masks were used in World War I. Those movies you saw with the guys with the, um, with the mask on, but little do we know that was a black man that invented that, that saved many lives. Mustard gas and all that kind of stuff in World War I. OK. Now, the second main item that uh, I invented was, um, <laughs> oh, the traffic light, yes. <laughs> the traffic light, I was so, yes. Now, yes. Yeah, I'm old. Now, the, what I noticed, um, traffic back then, there was no traffic signals, really. And, and, and traffic was just crazy. Buggies and horse and carriages and the new cars and Model Ts and pedestrians. And Cleveland was a big city. There was a lot of accidents. And what got me going was I saw an accident with a buggy and a horse and a car. And the little girl got hurt really bad. So I went back to my um, laboratory. And I invented this. It might be on the little the um, information that I gave you about the um, traffic signal. And basically, it was a three-tier traffic signal, which is never um, invented before, and basically you had to stop, go, and then you also had um, caution, and that really slowed down some of the traffic accidents at that time, at that time. And because it worked so well, uh, the Edison Company, excuse me, General Electric, General Electric bought my pattern for $40,000. That's why Gary Morgan can wear this top hat. I can afford this top hat. See? Right? So Garrett, because of Garrett, we had those traffic signals. That's Garrett. That's a black man. Um, so because of all my um, safety inventions, in 1911, I won an award for the New York Safety Expo, from New York Safety Expo. I could not go to New York City and accept this award. They wouldn't allow a black man to go. This is up north. They, I couldn't go to accept, so I sent my white brother to go accept the award for me. Now, speaking of that, going back to the gas mask, when this word got around about this great invention, I had to, um, when I contacted fire, fire posts, a lot of them were very interested in the gas mask. But some of them, and I, and I couldn't understand that, some of them declined because they found out a black man was the inventor. I mean, this, we're talking safety. And ignorance. Yeah, in ignorance. So, um, Oh, so I, another thing was I wanted to put these items in the newspaper in Cleveland, but I, they, I went to the publisher. Oh, no, we don't put black folks stuff in the paper. So what do you think Gary Morgan did? Started my own newspaper. There you go. Yes. I called it the Cleveland Call. And 
I called on other brothers and sisters that had any advertisements or events to come put it in the paper. Well, when the paper took off, we started making money. Well, all of a sudden, the Cleveland paper, the white Cleveland paper, took notice. I said, well, wait a minute. Because when it involves money, money's not black, money's not white. Money's green. So they contacted us, and they wanted to turn, turn it around. And all of a sudden, they want us to uh, get into their paper. But the Cleveland Call um, got together with the, uh, another, I don't have the name of the uh, paper, but another brother got with me, and we put the papers together and called it the Calling Post, which is still in print today out of Cleveland, Ohio, one of the first black newspapers in America. Thank you. Um, I was also part of a um, civil rights organization that teamed up with the new NAACP, and that's what it was formed as the NAACP. I was also a, an activist. I was concerned about my people. I ran for city council in 1932, but I lost. <laughs> but that was okay. Um, now, is there any other questions before Garrett Morgan sits down? Yes. We love you, Gary. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to thank everybody for giving me the chance to yeah. talk about a great black American here in the United States. Garrett Morgan. Yeah. Garrett Augustus Morgan. 1954. A young black boy, Emmett Till, oh, Lord, is brutally murdered yeah. for allegedly whistling at a white woman in Mississippi. Oh, Two white men charged with the crime are acquitted by an all-white jury. They later boast about committing the murder. Mm -hmm. The public outrage generated by the case helps spur the civil rights movement in August. December 1st, 1955. All right. My hero, Rosa Parks. Yeah. All right. Rosa Parks is coming home yeah. from work. Go she got on the bus, yeah. sat in her designated seat, well, that wasn't good enough. It was four women in that seat. One white man got on the bus and did not have a seat. So the bus driver, John Blake, asked the black women to leave their seats. Three got up. One did not. Who was that woman? Rosa Parks. It was Miss Rosa Parks. Come on, Rosa. Rosa Parks refused to leave her seat. Yeah. She said, this is my seat. I'm not leaving. Yes. She did not leave. The cops came and had to take her to jail. She spent a night in jail. The word of her getting in jail got out. A boycott was formed. The bus boycott lasted for one year. Rosa Parks began the civil rights movement, OK? She wrote an autobiography, and in her autobiography, she said, people always said that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired. That, that was not true. Yeah. I was not tired physically. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in, okay? She was tired of giving in. She took a stand that day, and that's what we have to do sometimes. We have to take a stand. Take a stand for what you believe in. And while that boycott was going on, it was led by none other than the Reverend Martin Luther King. And Dr. King is in the house today, and he's going to elaborate on that. Dr. King, Reverend Dr. King. And a lot of people don't realize that we call him Dr. King, and we forget the Reverend part. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King yeah. is very important because it was his reverence to God yeah. that kept right. him. Yeah. This is how a man or a woman gives their life, that they believe their faith. In God, amen? Amen. So in contrast, I'm going to say that, uh, as we all know, from the 16th Street Baptist Church, uh, there was a funeral, funeral of some little girls. And Dr. King said that these children, listen to these words, because this is, this is relevant to Brockton this week. These children are unoffending, innocent, and beautiful were victims of one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. That's the death of any child that dies from violence. Amen. And yet, they died nobly. 
They are martyred heroines of a holy crusade of freedom. Not only of freedom, but of human dignity. And so this afternoon, in a real sense, they have something to say to each of us from their death. They have something to say to every minister of the gospel who has remained silent behind the safe security of stained glass windows. This is relevant to Brockton. Right. They have something to say to every politician who has fed its constituents with stale bread of hatred and spoiled meat of racism. They have something to say to the federal government that has compromised with the undemocratic practices of southern uh, dixocrats and the blatant hypocrisy of white-wing northern republicans. It is something to say today about this. They have something to say to every Negro who has passively accepted the evil system of segregation and who has stood on the sidelines in a mighty struggle for justice. These are the dead children speaking now. They say to each of us, black and white alike, that we must substitute courage for caution. They say to each of us, we must be concerned not merely about who murdered them, oh, God help us, but about the system, the way of life, the philosophy which produced murderers. Talk to me in here. They're, they're saying to us that we must work passionately and unrelentingly for the realization of the American dream. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And then for those of us who constantly complain about Donald Trump, Dr. King said something from the grave about that too. When he talked about gaining from the ballot, Dr. King said we must realize that we are grappling with the most weighty social problems of this nation and grappling with a complex problem there is no place listen to this for misguided emotionalism right. ah, right. I'm gonna say that one more time okay. there is no place for misguided emotionalism we must work passionately and unrelentingly for the goal of freedom but what we must be sure that our hands are clean in the struggle did you hear that? Yeah. We, heard it. we must never struggle with falsehood, hate, or malice. Right. We must never, ever become bitter. Right. I know how we feel sometimes. There is a danger that those of us who have been forced so long amid the tragic midnight of oppression, those of us who have been trampled over, those of us who have been kicked about, there is a danger that we become bitter. But if we will become bitter and indulge ourselves in hate campaigns, the old, the new order which is emerging will become nothing but a duplication of the old order. May the church say amen. amen. Look to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. something's got to change. I'm going to go sit down. Thank you, Dr. King. Thank you, Dr. King. Great preacher. <laughs> and we're going to finish our timeline on black history. 1957, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a civil rights group, is established by Martin Luther King, Charles A. K. Steele, and Fred Southersworth. Nine black students are blocked from entering the school on the orders of Governor Oval Faubus. Federal troops and the National Guard are called to intervene on behalf of the students, who become known as the Little Rock Nine. Despite a year of violent threats, several of the Little Rock Nine managed to graduate from Central High. In 1960, Four black students in Greensboro, North Carolina, began a sit-in at the segregated Woolworths. I'm from Winston-Salem. <laughs> lunch counter. Six months later, the Greensboro Four are served lunch at the same Woolworths counter. Right. The event triggers many similar nonviolent <laughs> protests throughout the South. The student 
Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is founded, providing young blacks with a place in the civil rights movement. In 1960, over the spring and summer, student volunteers began taking bus trips through the South to test out new laws that prohibit segregation in interstate travel facilities, which includes bus and railway stations. Several other groups of freedom riders, as they are called, are attacked by angry mobs along the way. The program, sponsored by the Congress of Racial Equality and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, involves more than 1,000 volunteers, black and white. In 1962, James Meredith becomes the first black student to enroll at the University in Mississippi. President Kennedy sends 5,000 federal troops after rioting breaks out, just because he wants to enroll there. 1963, Martin Luther King is arrested and jailed during an anti-segregation protest in Birmingham, Alabama. He writes a letter from Birmingham jail, which advocated nonviolent and civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. The march in Washington for jobs and freedom is attended by about 250,000 people, the largest demonstration ever seen in a nation's capital. Martin Luther King delivers his famous I Have a Dream speech. <coughs> the march builds momentum for civil rights legislation. Despite George, Governor George Wallace physical, physically blocking their way, Vivian Malone and James Hood registered for classes at the University of Alabama. Four young black girls attending a Sunday school are killed when a bomb explodes at the 16th Street Baptist Church. Remember that? Yeah. A proper location for civil rights meetings. Riots erupt in Birmingham, leading to the deaths of two more black youths. Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act, the most sweeping civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. It prohibits discrimination of all kinds based on race, color, religion, or national origin. The bodies of three civil rights workers are found. Murdered by the KKK, James E. Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Swerner had been working to register black voters in Mississippi. Martin Luther King receives the Nobel Peace Prize. Sidney Poitier, who is the best actor for the role in Lilies of the Field. He is the first African American to win the award. Male, I should say, because Hattie Daniels won. In 1965, Malcolm X, black nationalist and founder of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, is assassinated in February. State troopers violently attacked peaceful demonstrators led by Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr as they crossed the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. 50 marchers are hospitalized on a bloody Sunday after police use tear gas, whips, and clubs against them. The march is considered catalyst for pushing through the Voting Rights Act five months later. Congress passes the Voting Rights Act of 1965, making it easier for Southern blacks to register to vote literacy tests, poll taxes, and other such requirements that were used to restrict black voting are made illegal. In six days, a rise in Watts, a black section of Los Angeles, 35 people are killed and 883 were injured. 1966, the Black Panthers are founded by Huey Newton and Bobby Steele. Remember those? Yeah. 1967, Stokey Carmichael a leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, coins the phrase, what? Anybody know? Black power. In a speech in Seattle, major race riots take place in Newark and Detroit. President Johnson appoints Thurgood Marshall to the Supreme Court. He becomes the first black Supreme Court justice. The Supreme Court rules in Loving versus Virginia that prohibiting interracial marriage is unconstitutional. 
16 states still have anti-miscegenation laws and are forced to revise them. I think that's revised by now. 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. President Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act of 1968, prohibiting discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing. Shirley Chisholm becomes the first black female U.S. representative. A Democrat from New York, she was elected in November and served from 1969 to 1983. 1978, the Supreme Court case, Regents of the University of California versus Bates upheld the constitutionality of affirmative action, but imposed limitations on it to ensure that providing greater opportunities for minorities did not come at the expense of the rights of the majority. That makes sense, right? <laughs> Whole lot of sense. 1992, the first race riots in decades erupt in South Central Los Angeles after a jury acquits four white police officers for the videotape beating of African American Rodney King. Can we all just get along? Yes. 2001, Colin Powell becomes the first African American U.S. Secretary of State. 2002, Halle Berry becomes the first African American woman to win the Best Actress Oscar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, she takes home the statue for her role in Monsters Ball. Denzel Washington, the star of Training Day, earns the Best Actor Award that same year. That made history. Okay. 2005, Condoleezza Rice becomes the first black female Secretary of State. In 2006, in Paris versus Seattle and Meredith versus Jefferson, affirmative action suffers a setback when a bitterly divided court rules five to four that programs in Seattle and Louisville, Kentucky, which try to maintain diversity in schools by considering race when assigning students to schools are unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. 2008. We know what happened in 2008, don't we? Yes! President Barack Obama, he won two terms. We don't need to, to expand on him. We know about him. 2013. The movement began with the use of the hashtag Black Lives Matter on social media after the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the shooting death of African American teen Trayvon Martin. Black Lives Matter became nationally recognized for its street demonstrations following the 2014 deaths of two African Americans, Micah Brown, resulting in protests and unrest in Ferguson and Eric Garner in New York City. There have been many reactions to Black Lives Matter's movement. The U.S. population's perception of Black Lives Matter varies by race. The phrase, all lives matter, sprang up as a response to Black Lives Matter. However, all lives matter has been criticized for dismissing or misunderstanding yeah. the message of Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Following the shooting police officer in Ferguson, the hashtag Blue Lives Matter was created by supporters of the police. On August 9th, 2014, Michael Brown was unarmed and was shot and killed at Ferguson, Missouri by Darren Wilson. On November 24th, the grand jury decision not to indict Wilson was announced, sparking protests in Ferguson and cities across the U.S including Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, and Boston. The protests continued to spread throughout the country after a state Staten Island grand jury decided in December not to indict Daniel Pantel, mm. the police officer involved in the death of Eric Gardner. Gardner died after being placed in a chokehold mm. in July. I can't breathe. I can't, I can't breathe. breathe. In 2014, the 114th Congress includes 46 black members in the House of Representatives and two in the Senate. And this is the end of our Black Lives, um, Black History Month timeline. But this is 2018. And have things changed? No. Are they still the same? Yeah. Like she said, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. 
we got to take a stand. When we need to take a stand, we're going to take a stand. No matter what it is, we're going to take a stand. Thank you guys for coming. Do you have any questions for us? Do you want to eat some? Yes, Miss Deacon Jackson. I love you. Oh, excuse me. How, 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 do I, how do I know you? Was that the question? Was that the question? You want to come, Miss Deacon? You want to come up here? No, come. Give her Yeah. <laughs> All I was going to say is, uh, I look, I always be observing when people are having things, and I always look to see if any children are going to be there. Because they're going to take our place. Well, not mine. I'm so old now, there's no place to be taken. But I know my granddaughter, my my great granddaughter and uh, this young man, I know his daddy's face, but I can't think of his son. DJ. DJ. You know, when the Y uh, announced it, you should, you, nowadays, I think it would help. You may not think, but I think it does. That's why he let me say this. You need to send yourself or somebody at all of the schools here in Brockton to say, call them early enough. Not that day, but at a different time, tell them you're going to have something that you want the children to hear and you think they would be uh, in, in... Actually, I did do that. I don't you, went to, yes. you went to every school and talked? I, I, no, via uh, telephone and email. Oh, no. No, you got it. Mandatory. Oh, mandatory? Yeah. You, that's 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 well, you don't have to make it mandatory, but you don't need to see nothing on the phone. Mm -hmm. I know you ignore me, but you don't need no, to no, do it no, on the no, phone, do and you don't need to be, uh, uh, you know, just singing about it. You need to go there and ma tell them, uh, don't even tell them you're coming. Then say when you get there, I have a very important message, announcement. It only takes five minutes to tell the children. Mm -hmm. And then you tell, you go in, and you tell them. If they find out, you don't have to let them know you're uh, say, are you having a, uh, what do you call it now when they gather together? In the Assembly, assembly. 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 An assembly, and you just show up and have a word to say, and you have to tell them nowadays. They claim they're so busy, our young people, they ain't as busy as they think they are. And you need to help them. You can't help them if you Now, my great-great-granddaughter said, but she may not even, she's interested because she came with her dad and all, whatever. And I know she's absorbing something. I don't have to worry about that. Because when she gets ready, she'll get up and tell me. But anyway, it's wonderful to see all of us here, but you need to let the children know as well. Make it a promise from your club or whoever it is. I'm a, when I walk in, I'm going to have a, a young person that can understand on my arm. Okay. And walk in on No, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else have a comment? You want to make? You see a chance? You have a comment? Just want to just add this. So I know somebody has another comment, but just want to make sure that we add that Erica Gardner passed. Does everyone know that? His daughter actually passed, and many of us that have worked in the mental health field, who've worked in the you know stressful environments, realize that probably what caused her death, she had a few heart attacks, was the stress of the work that she was doing uh, for her father, and of course the stress uh, from losing her dad in such a heinous way. So you know this civil rights uh, stuff can kill you. Uh, and it may not be an assassination by a bullet, but it could be an assassination by your mind. Yeah. So you have to be mindful of that. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Anyone else have, have a comment you want to make? No? I don't know. Oh, sure. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tony Saunders. And I want to let you know that what I have done and what I am doing for the past 16 years is working with our kids with special needs and without special needs, teaching them what happened in the past and what we need to do to have a future. Because our children right now are in dire need of our help, of our help with their education. Because if they don't go through the entire school system 
and get that diploma, guess what happens to them? They become a system, a system, they start working, I mean, being a part of the social service and the um, criminal justice system. And that is egregious. We need, we have to work with our children. Amen. We have to teach them our history, but not just our history, what they're moving forward for, what their future could be. A lot of our kids are living in anxiety and depression. Very, very young. I had a student who was raped when she was eight years old by being pulled off of a bike. And a man pulled her off of the bike and raped her. She never got any therapy. She never got the help she needed. And what the system did was put her on medication and start giving her all these different um, diagnoses. Unfortunately, last week, she was put in DYS lockup. And just because she ran from the program that she was in, because she was angry. They didn't arrest her for anything but that. We have a problem here, and I keep, you know, putting out on social media, my name is Tony Saunders, I'm always out there. If you know of anybody, <laughs> my daughter's laughing, if you know of anyone who needs help with their children, you know, the system is taking kids that have autism and they're putting them in court for their behavior. Mercy. You know, I saw, I saw in Florida where they took an autistic kid who was going ballistic for whatever reason, but he was autistic, and they put him on top of the police car in the hot, hot sun and made him lay there with handcuffs on. Yeah, that was in the news. It's so much. We have to make a change. There's just too much going on. And if we can all keep coming, keep gathering, keep talking about what we need to do and then doing it. I'm one of those people that's doing it. And I plan on continuing to do it until the day I die. <laughs> But in the meantime, let's stay together. Amen. Let's stay together. Did you take um, num numbers, email addresses, and all that of people that are in this room right now? Is there a sign-in sheet? Oh, okay. Good. No, you don't. I'll give it to you. All right. All right. So that's all I wanted to say. Is there anyone else? If there's no one else, could you all just stand on your feet, please? Just stand on your feet, and if you can, grab each other's hand. Grab each other's hand. Was at the Brockton Mall, and young kids were talking about the murder of the two children, the Brittle brothers. And one of the young men said that, you know, my mother doesn't go to church anymore. And my father is a part of a different religion, and they don't pray often. As I was walking by, I felt obligated to put my nose in it. And I said to him, the same thing happened with the disciples when they asked Jesus, how do we pray? So we combine our hands today as one. Regardless of race, ethnicity, or religion, today with our hands, we are one. And can you all who know the Lord's Prayer recite it by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, or our, our debtors, some say trespasses, as we forget our trespasses against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
and deliver us from all evil. For thy is what? Is what? The power and the glory.